but you know, what if it does? And what we then get is a fantastic bit of footage of a trebuchet exploding on launch, bits flying everywhere, whole thing collapses, you get to see some great footage. It's a win for everybody. Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today I'm back with the trebuchet again. And some of the changes that I have made before we start shooting it again, some of the changes I'm not going to make. So first up, when this was originally made by Bill and myself for the Age of Empires computer game launch, they made us do some things that, you know, I didn't really want to do. It, it, it wasn't made how I would have chosen to make it. So I'm sort of correcting that now. And that's what we've been doing. So I've remade the sling. I've strengthened up the pivot up at the top there. I've re-straightened the bucket because that was damaged during the original filming because some of the stuff was a bit light. Really, the way I originally set it up with the winch system, I didn't like. It wasn't really working very well, so I've redone that as well. But we're going to come and talk to that more at length because that's really quite interesting in its own right. We're going to start by talking about the sling. Now, the thing about the sling is it's like every other part of this machine. They're all related. All aspects are related. And so the weight of the projectile, the length of the sling, the weight of the counterweight, the distance between the pivots, I'm going to give you all of those later, uh, between the bucket and the bucket pivot and the bucket pivot and the main pivot and the tip, and all of these things are all related. And that changes how your machine operates. Now, I've been getting some uh, original information of a guy called Jem Stansfield, an old friend of mine, and possibly the smartest man who has ever lived. Uh, I'll put a link in the notes to Jem. He has designed a very special trebuchet, but you don't know about that yet, but you will. And he also designed this one. Now, I will honestly say that I actually changed his stats because I made a little scale model of it and I wanted to see visually how it looked because I was making it for a TV programme. I wanted a particular look, a, a computer game launch. So I fudged his numbers around a little bit. So this is not optimised according to Jem's calculations. So, sorry Jem. However, there's another guy over in the States, Daniel Bertrand. I think he was Utah, I said earlier. And he's been messing around with trebuchets for many years now. And he has a fantastic one that's a little bit bigger than this. You know, it's, I think the main arm is about 4.8 metres from the pivot to the tip. Mine's 3.5. And he's getting extraordinary distances, 300 metres. Again, link in the notes, check his films out. But he's been talking about tuning. I am not ready to tune this yet. I'm still building up the weights and trying to understand it. But what I do know is that when I come to tune this sling, I might need to adjust it. So I've just made this whole section here adjustable. I can get about another 80, 90 centimetres on length if I want. But then we come to the main sling itself. And this is made with crown knots. They're, it's a net. That's all it is. If your cup holds the projectile too tightly, if you sort of like form the cup around the projectile, it doesn't come out cleanly. So I have deliberately made this so that it holds the shot, in this case a bowling ball, but not wraps around it. That's really quite important. So I'll show you this with our bowling ball in it. So that may not look enormously secure, but it's secure enough actually. Again, my work with, with using a regular kind of sling tells me that this ball will stay in this. And you need it to be in, but not really in. And that's how you get a nice clean release of it. The original brief included the possibility of throwing washing machines. They never actually did, but it meant that the distance between these A-frames had to be very wide. That, of course, means you've got a wide axle, and as the weight comes down, especially if you're shooting something light, the weight slams down to the bottom, massively loads this axle here, and that can potentially cause a big problem. It's actually 50 mil, two inch thick solid bar. Maybe it would bend, maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. But what I did do was I just quickly, I should have done it in timber and it would have been beautiful, but I've done it in steel. I've just made these big brackets here to bring effectively a buttress to this point here. So now there is an awful lot more strength in this whole pivot assembly. If I hire it out ever for a, um, a historic event, I'll probably remake this in wood. But at the moment, just a quick and dirty job, it's done in steel. We're gonna talk about the counterweight bucket now. When we did the first bit of filming uh, for the computer game launch, we actually damaged the machine because we kept on shooting things, throwing things which were too light. And if you imagine just, if you want to go kick a, a football or a soccer ball, if you connect with the ball, there's some resistance and uh, your body works fine. If you don't connect with that ball, yes, you might fall over. But the other thing is you can actually end up hurting yourself because you're expecting a resistance on your leg when you kick it and you don't get it. And any kinetic machine is much like that, that it wants a little bit of resistance to damp the movement, to 
to stop it just like jerking around crazy. So when we actually damaged it, what happened was the bucket came down swinging and jerking around violently. And it actually ended up hitting the edge of this support here. Not that violently, fortunately, but it did rip a chunk off. So then when I came back here, I put these guide rails on, but again, I hadn't straightened the bucket. And so the first shot, again, this bucket came in and scraped the side of this. And it immediately told me I had to sort the problem out. And now because the bucket is completely centered, completely straight within the framework, that gives me the confidence really to put more and more weight in it. The rest of the structure I believe is gonna be strong enough. I'm not worried about that. But this being crooked was a problem. No problem anymore. The original brief was to make this as medieval as possible. And so I bought these wonderful pulleys off eBay, you know, st uh, iron and, and wooden sheaths, and they work great, but they're not rated. And I don't know what load they take. And I think they'll be fine, ultimately, but last week I wasn't so keen. So I've changed that now, and I now have lovely modern pulleys, which are rated and I can believe in, and they're nice and strong. I've upped the rope on the winch rope, about twice the breaking strain it was before but I still wasn't really getting the system to work properly in the way I wanted. And I came to the conclusion that the winch system I was using wasn't any good. Conversation with Daniel Bertrand over in the States, and he was saying, I think other people over there where they love their trebuchets for pumpkin chunking, also don't like that rigging system. And I've gone for what everybody else has done, which is that there's a pulley on the end of the arm and it pulls the arm down and everything is smoother and easier and wonderful. But actually that's an interesting point. So why did I rig it in the first place the way I did? Well, there is a guy, and I'm sorry for what I'm about to say, French people. Is a guy, was a guy, called Violet Le Duc. Lived in the 19th century and wrote some fantastic books on arms and armor and really started a movement in France, as I understand it, to preserve their, their heritage, their actual built environment around them, their old buildings and, and that whole sort of historical culture that otherwise was just getting replaced and built over. And he was an incredibly important man and did some incredibly good things and was knowledgeable. But he did what a lot of other authors did at that time, which was if he didn't know the answer, he didn't want to write that in a book, he just made it up. There are some beautiful pictures of trebuchets in his book, which are so detailed, you think, well, clearly these are copies of originals. But I don't think they were. I think he was just looking at original manuscript pictures and reinterpreting it and reinventing. And he put a rigging system on it that works, but it doesn't work very well. And I was really struggling with it, and so I decided to change it. So actually what's happened now is I've upped all the rigging system to cope with the old one that I didn't like, and now it's actually probably well over spec for the way I'm doing it now. But the whole system is beautiful and smooth. If you watch the previous films of me winching it down, and, well, from now on, you'll see there is quite a difference in the way the winch system operates. But what that also means is I was going to reduce the size of this drum because it was so hard to do with the old system. Now it's much easier. I keep the drum nice and big and it makes it a little bit faster. But two things that keep on coming up again and again are, firstly, cracks in, in the timber work and people saying, oh, the whole thing's gonna collapse on you. Well, you know, particularly if you're European and you're used to old timber buildings that we have over here of maybe five, six, 700 years old, look at the cracks in those timbers. Those cracks are big enough to put your hand into the building stands. I'm not expecting any of these cracks to ever be a problem. They do not concern me in the slightest. What concerns me a little bit more is if something happens to the main beam, the main throwing arm. But that has been laminated up out of lots of bits. You expect to see the joins. But again, you know, I've pegged it, I've bolted it, I've clamped it, I've glued it, I've roped it. I'm not expecting the arm to give up. But you know, what if it does? Well, I'm back a little way on my trigger string, so I'm not in any danger. And what we then get is a fantastic bit of footage of a trebuchet exploding on launch, bits flying everywhere, whole thing collapses, you get to see some great footage, I get to rebuild my machine, it's a win for everybody. I'm not expecting a problem with the arm, but if it is, well, it's just another bit of filming, isn't it? So that's the first one. The second one is wheels on the trebuchet. Now there is, again, I'll put a link in the notes, an amazing guy, Tom Stanton, who does some extraordinary engineering projects. A real sharp dude. He was messing about with trebuchets two or three years ago. Different format to this, a sort of a modern conception of one, and smaller. And he found in his optimising trebuchets that putting wheels on that improved it massively and he explained why. And that's great, but this is a lot bigger. This is a soft field and I haven't got the time to put the wheels on, but also I expect that they never did. I don't know for a fact, but I don't think that they put wheels on their trebuchets back in the day. And part of the reason for that is I don't know how many tons, you know, if you look at the one at Warwick, how many tons that is. 
30, 40, 50 tons, I don't know. Now putting wheels on that, on fairly soft, uneven ground, ground that can get rained on, turned into a quagmire, you know, the machines going backwards and forwards, I just can't see that working. And I suspect that they never did it. So it might improve efficiency, but it's, it, you know, it's one of those sort of like theoretical things. Yeah, theoretically, it does improve efficiency. Real world, you spend a whole load of time making wheels that won't turn because you're stuck up to your axles and mud. That would be my guess. I want to play around with this thing. I don't want to put wheels on it. That's not what I, that interests me. I just want to shoot it. I'm just going to run through some of the dimensions of the machine now, and that will help us to understand what it should deliver in the end, what we should be able to get out of it. So from the centre of the counterweight, centre of the bucket there, to the pivot on the bottom of the arm, 125 centimetres. From the pivot at the bottom of the arm to the main axle, 125 centimetres again. And from the main axle to the tip of the arm is 360 centimetres, 3.6 metres. So those are the dimensions of this machine, and they're not going to change. The weight in the counterweight bucket, that's going to increase over time. So I'm going to get it up to around about 500 kilos if I just fill it with concrete and sand. I'm not going to get it up more than that, but that'll be fine. You know, that'll be fine for me. I'm not going world beating. I just want to have a nice fun machine to mess about with. And then talking to Daniel over in the States again, he's explained that there's actually rules of thumb about these machines, which I just love that people can have these conversations and go, yeah, yeah, of course it works like this. It's the modern world is a weird place with things like this. But anyway, I have a trebuchet and I need to know about it. So Daniel's a really handy guy. And he's explained that with the counterweight here, if we look at, let's say, 150th of that weight, which is around about three and a half kilos, this house brick, that's a good weight for this machine to be throwing. Now that house brick is going to go around about 50 times the length of the arm from pivot to tip, which is around about 180 meters, if the sling is the right length and that he couldn't tell me. So that is down to me to find out. But basically it means at its very best, this machine should deliver a house brick around about 180 meters. And that's coming from a long way up. So I can tell you that's gonna be pretty destructive. And more so when I set them on fire, because this is actually the core of the incendiary charges. I needed a bit of weight in those. So that's what's inside these, but not right now, because first up we're gonna do the bowling balls, which actually in truth are a little bit heavier a little bit heavier than this machine wants to shoot, but it will shoot them just fine. So there's one last thing that I need to show you. One little change. Special guest star. And this is the last change. My trebuchet support vehicle, a Land Rover 101 GS. And it's got its bowling ball dispenser on the front here, as you can see. Fits three bowling balls. And it allows me to drive out into the field, 150 odd metres, pick up my ammunition, and bring them back. Just save me some walking across wet fields, basically. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you will also spot a winch on the front, which I will not be using to winch my trebuchet down. I'm gonna do it old school. But let's start shooting some bowling balls and we'll see where we get to. The GoPro is back. One camera, three GoPros later, and anything this brave deserves a name. So this is a Graham. So Graham the fourth is going into the trusty night vision armored unit and we're gonna put him out 130 meters. And the reason we're gonna do that is I've put the weight up. So it is 440 kilos. We got 117 meters before, I think. So I'm reckoning on 130, 135 meters, fingers crossed. And that's where we're gonna put this. See you in a minute. So courtesy of Jenny, you've just seen it winch down and this is where it all gets a bit different. So now what I need to do is attach the trigger on, put a safety line on, then back the whole winch rope off and that stays attached to the arm. So when the arm flies up, it needs enough slack on that rope. If that rope catches anywhere, anywhere, when that arm is swinging around, it's gonna rip something apart. The result is not good. So you've gotta be really quite careful about how you lay it out. So I'm just gonna slack it off now, position the ropes and then we go. All looks good, all looks ready. Let's shoot. Firing. Three, two, one. Goodness gracious me. I was unusually silent there for that one, but that was really high, really, really high. And that needs adjustment, needs a longer sling, I think. But that's not this week's show. That's, we'll, we'll come back for tuning another time. But hopefully we can now see the movement of it in the wide over there. But more importantly, I can go out, I can take the position of that 
and replant my GoPro and see if we can get it really close. Two things. First, I said firing last time. I meant loose, of course, or shooting. Secondly, it went beyond the GoPro, so I moved some things. Loosing! Oh, that is a thing to see. It really is a thing to see. So let's go and have a look at the GoPro end of town and we'll do it all again. And this was the first shot just down here at my feet. So the second one that I just did after I repositioned the GoPro whoop, is just here. So six, seven meters away. So that's just here. Impact was here and impact for the first one was here. So about six meters apart, something like that. We're gonna come back and look at accuracy, but that is not today's one. So the next one, we're gonna reposition the GoPro again because it's actually a little bit lighter than the next ball. So I'm gonna run this back another 10 meters and we'll see how we go. But we're getting really good distances today. Uh, I haven't actually bothered measuring. I'm guessing about 130, 135 meters at the moment. So again, this was our first strike, second strike a little behind me. So I've now run the, the GoPro and the helmet another 10 meters or so that way. So in the background, Jenny is working away, loving it. Got a red bowling ball there, which is the lightest. So it's about 700 grams lighter than the others. They're seven kilos, they're 6.3 kilos. And well, we're losing the light. So it's gonna be the last of the bowling balls today. And if you're losing the light and you got a trebuchet, oh, I wonder what you could throw next. Hmm. Three, two, one, loose. Whoa! -ho -ho! And down! Oh my goodness me, that was a close one. I'm really sorry guys, I have totally messed up the audio in this last section of the film. In fact, I left my microphone right next to the trebuchet. Now what that means is, well, you're not gonna hear me for a few minutes, but you are gonna hear the exact sound a trebuchet makes when you're standing next to it, when it shoots. And not many people can say that up to now, so that's one bonus. Now from now on, this whole thing is finished. Everything's done. It's tuning, it's getting it to work reliably. So that's what the next films are gonna be about. But in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this one. See you again soon. And well, check out the new Trebuchet t-shirts. They're on the merch shelf below the film. See ya. This time, I can say firing.